We're going to have an interesting day today because we're going to try to cover a great deal of material. Um, at the same time, um, while many of us are drawn by curiosity, many of us are drawn by urgent needs because there are many hurting people that are in some way involved with some of the strange goings on. So we're going to talk about today a Christian perspective of UFOs. And uh, what we're going to do today, this morning I'm going to try to lay some foundations, and then this afternoon Mark Eastman will um, review uh, the nature of UFOs, the nature of this alien contacts that are being reported, and then we're going to try to tie this all together in, ter in terms of its spiritual perspectives. Now one of the things that's going to come up, and I wanted to lay the groundwork right up front in this conference, is the nature of reality as we understand it from, the, from modern science, and uh, to take advantage of a message that we're in possession of that we can uh, prove and demonstrate that is clearly of extraterrestrial origin. So that's my burden in the next two one-hour segments of this. And uh, so fashion your seatbelts. One of the things that the secular researchers have concluded about the UFOs, now let's just cut through this. We're here at Roswell, so many people here obviously come here with all kinds of presuppositions. It doesn't take any insight to realize that the whole UFO area is full of hoaxes, nonsense, and foolishness. And indeed, many people are here in Roswell just in good-natured kidding and having fun. But when you strip away the hoaxes on the one hand, and when you strip away the deliberate disinformation by some very well-resourced groups on the other hand, what you have left is disturbingly real. There are occasions where these UFOs are confirmed, uh, they're tracked on radar, leave radiation behind, they're tangible on the one hand, and on the other hand, they behave in ways that totally defy our perception of physical laws. There are many people that presume that they are from some other galaxy or in some outer space context. However, those of you that have done serious research in this area know that the most competent researchers in this area, people like J. Allen Hynek, who, who passed away a few years ago, and uh, Jacques Vallée and others, have come to the conclusion they're not from some other galaxy, they're from another dimension within our own. And so one of the things we want to talk about, this, that's, that's strange talk, and we can glibly use cliches without really understanding uh, what they mean, drawn either from science, mathematics, or even the Bible, and use them rather glibly. We want to cut through that a little bit and lay some foundation. So I want to talk a little bit about hyperspaces. Now, the trouble with hyperspace is there's only two kinds of people that seem to be able to reasonably deal with hyperspaces. Mathematicians that have special training or small children. <laughs> they have no problem with this sort of thing. Now, let's back up and talk with Euclid. Euclid's writings are probably the most widely circulated and popular for the last 2,000 years, second only to the Bible. And I'd like to just talk a little bit about trigonometry. Let me ask you a question. How many of you uh, know how many degrees are there in a triangle? If I take a triangle, typically say a 30, 60, 90 triangle, and add up the degrees, it adds up to what? 180 degrees, exactly. Uh, if I take a 45, 45, 90, uh, as another example, again, the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. That's, how, how many knew that? Okay, good. Well, suppose Dr. Eastman and I walked out into the large desert area out here and laid out a very large triangle. And as we compared our calculations, we discovered that our angles added up to more than 180 degrees. What would you conclude? That we screwed up again. What you'd expect from Chuck and Mark, right? <laughs> no, if we have a triangle that adds up to more than 180 degrees, and, and we check our figures, it's accurate, what have we encountered? The curvature of the Earth, exactly right. In other words, a third dimension. See, these little rules that we learned in school have to do with plane geometry, a geometry of only two dimensions. If you take a course in navigation, you encounter spherical trigonometry where you can have a triangle with 90 degrees in each corner. And again, this is a, a, a way that we encounter 
an additional dimension. A three-dimensional triangle obviously can have degree. In fact, that's how you know it's three-dimensional if, if, if it violates that uh, original geometry. Now, that's the kind of insight that led to Dr. Einstein's um, solutions as he grappled with the nature of our reality. Most of you know that in 1905, he uh, had a special theory of relativity which, in which length, mass, and velocity, and time are relative to the velocity of the observers, the famous initial step of this. And it was a few years later that he generalized this theory, and he discovered that there really is no distinction between time and space. If you're really properly briefed, you will always speak of space-time. We don't do that. We're comfortable with three spatial dimensions and time. We te treat, them separately, uh, treat them separately. But we know uh, in modern science that we live, live in at least a four-dimensional continuum. And by the way, this has been confirmed 12 different ways to five decimal places and beyond. In fact, I understand recently an experiment confirmed it to 14 decimal places. So the point is, they're really, while we call it the theory of relativity, it's far more than a theory, it's well confirmed. Now, this leads us then into the whole area of hyperspaces. You and I would tend to be most comfortable at visualizing this as three spatial dimensions, length, width, and height, and time. And, uh, but time itself is a physical property. And in particle physics today, you read, if you're concurrent in reading particle physics, you know that they have concluded that we actually live in 10 dimensions. And it's interesting that that was perceived by the ancient Hebrew writers from Genesis chapter 1. But uh, rather than do our homework in Genesis 1, we've spent billions of dollars on accelerators to determine it the hard way. But in any case, now the point, the reason we're getting into this today is I think it's going to be useful for at least to consider the possibility that these UFOs, and more importantly, their occupants and whatever, are coming to us not from some far galaxy, although they seem to be posing as if they are, but they come from another dimension, and that has profound implications for you and I. Now, we have trouble going up in dimensions. If I start talking four or five dimensions, you and I will be at a loss, because we're not specially trained in that way. But we can gain some insights by imagining something less than three and drawing some inferences. Let's imagine a world that has only two dimensions, like a plane. And let's imagine in our imagination that there are occupants, with two-dimensional occupants within that two-dimensional plane. Now, if we came along as a three-dimensional person and put our finger through that plane, what would the two-dimensional people in that two-dimensional world observe? A circle. Or a hole, yes, in a sense. Right, exactly. Let's take another example. If a three-dimensional sphere is passing through that two-dimensional universe, it will appear as a point that enlarges to a circle and then that reduces back to a point. Because they would be perceiving a two-dimensional slice of that three-dimensional object passing through. Are we together? Now, Let's assume we didn't have a circle, we had some other kind of an object here represented such as a cube. If that cube tumbles through that space, not only will it start from a point and get big and then shrink, it will change shape as it goes through, and depending on how it's being cut by that plane. Are we together so far? There are many, Jacques Vallée, who's probably one of the most prominent published people in the UFO area, has suggested that these UFOs may be windows into another dimension more so than objects. And you and I have a tough time relating to that, but he may be very, very correct. Let's assume that we were trying to communicate a three-dimensional object to a two-dimensional world. We would be asking that two-dimensional world to encounter things that they don't encounter in their experience. Their imag our imaginations are generally limited to our own experiences. One way we could try to do it if we had a cube would be to project that three-dimensional image into a two-dimensional space and maybe rotate it. And, but its behavior in the two-dimensional space would be bizarre to the two-dimensional uh, occupants in any case. We'd, now, another way we could do that would be to take a three-dimensional cube, say, and unravel it into two dimensions. And we would take that two-dimensional cube and start to unfold it and lay it out flat, and that would be a way, possibly, to try to get a two-dimensional being that we're communicating with to recognize what a three-dimensional cube might be. But all of these are very imperfect because we're asking that two-dimensional 
being in a two-dimensional world to extend their concepts into a dimension, uh, into a, a, a region that they have no experience with. Now let's take another example, and that is a, there are such things as hypercubes, a four-dimensional cube. How do I represent a hypercube in the three dimensions? One way is to unravel it, and one suggestion is what's called a Hinton cube, which is an unraveled, an unraveled Hinton cube, or a hypercube, called a tesseract. And even you and I look at that and have a tough time trying to relate to a four-dimensional cube. You say, well, what practical use of it? Interestingly enough, Salvador Dali used that tesseract, a four-dimensional cube, in his uh, famous painting of the crucifixion. And we'll come back to some of these issues a little bit later. What we've done here in just a little uh, tent of exploration is go beyond Euclid. Um, and we like to uh, talk about more than three dimensions, hyperspaces. It turns out the most important lecture ever given in history, in math, uh, history of mathematics occurred in June of 1854 when George Riemann, who was a pastor's son, by the way, um, gave a, uh, developed a set of mathematics, metric tensors, that opened our thinking to be able to represent meaningfully hyperspaces, spaces of more than three dimensions. And that it was, a, it took about uh, 60 years later that Einstein, exploiting those concepts, developed his four-dimensional space-time. Now the irony of Einstein's life is he went to his death frustrated by not being able to relate gravity and light into that region. And it was actually in 1953 that Kaluza and Klein together um, developed by extending another dimension. Light is basically a vibration in five dimensions. Light and supergravity have been integrated by the Kaluza-Klein uh, models, which are basically extending this four-dimensional space into more than four, five, six, and so forth. And in 1963, the Yang Mills fields, extending it even further, have integrated electromagnetic and both the nuclear forces, both the strong and the weak nuclear forces, for those of you that are familiar with physics. There are four basic forces in the universe. And three of the four have been integrated by the techniques. Now, the current thinking from about 1984 on is that the universe actually consists of what the mathematicians called superstrings and uh, that they actually involve 10-dimensional mathematics. Now, it's not our purpose here to get into this area, because there's two kinds of people in the audience, those are that are familiar with this, and those that already have learned more than they really want to know about <laughs> hyperspaces. <laughs> but I want to mention this because there seems to be good evidence from the reports that these encounters that are going on involve hyperspaces. These UFOs and their occupants not only are clocked on radar and elsewhere at making right angle turns at speeds that are incredible, which imply they're massless by our physics. They also go faster than the speed of sound without sonic booms, and that's a disturbing thing. But what's most disturbing is they seem to have the ability to materialize and dematerialize at will. And that disturbs us. It makes them seem very, what we would use the term, supernatural. But that supernatural term may be derived only because of our limited understanding of nature. And let's move on a little bit. I want to cover something else because it's going to be very important for you and I as an opportunity to validate a message. And I want us to shed some baggage that we tend to carry with ourselves about this strange dimension called time. You and I tend to presume that time is linear and absolute. We assume that an hour yesterday is like an hour or a year from now, and that there's really uh, no discernible difference. We also uh, uh, think of time as linear, and when we were in school, the teacher would draw a line on the blackboard, and, and it would uh, start, the, the, the left end would be the beginning of something, the birth of a person, the founding of a nation, or some such thing, and the right end of the line might be the death of that person, or the termination of that empire, or what have you. We've made timelines, how many of you have made timelines in school? Well, how many of you went to school? <laughs> okay, that's right. Well, because of this idea, when we encounter the concept of eternity, we jump to the model in our minds that eternity is sort of like a line that starts at infinity on the left and that goes to infinity on the right. That's a, nat a natural extrapolation from our own experience. Therefore, when we encounter something like God, we think of someone who has lots of time. 
And that turns out to be bad physics. Because God is not, see, time we've learned from Einstein is a physical property. And let's explore that a little bit because that's important. We exist in more than three dimensions and time itself is a physical property. Time, we know, varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity, just to name a few. And let me demonstrate that for you. If I had an atomic clock here on the platform and I raised it one meter, it would speed up by one part in 10 to the 16th. Not enough to adjust our personal schedules, obviously, but the point is predictable and measurable. If I raise it 100 meters, it would speed up by one part in 10 to the 14th. Now, the uh, United States Naval Observatory actually conducted an experiment in 1971, put an atomic clock on an airplane, went around the world eastward, compared to an atomic clock at rest at the observatory, it lost 0.06 microseconds. They put one on an atomic clock going westward around the world and it gained 0.27 microseconds. Not a lot, but the point is, by accounting for all the variables, that's exactly what Einstein's theory would predict and that's exactly what they experienced. The point is time is a physical dimension. Let me give you another example. It's if you read a physics textbook in this area, you'll almost always encounter an, a, hy a hypothetical example of the two astronauts. And we imagine two astronauts born at the same instant, and we're going to send one of them to the nearest star, which happens to be Alpha Centauri, about four and a half light years away. If you apply the uh, uh, Lorentz transformations here, it turns out, and we, we're going to send this guy, the guy's traveling, to Alpha Centauri at half the speed of light and then bring him back. Alpha Centauri being four and a half light years away, going at half the speed, take him nine years to get there, nine years to get back. But when he gets back, he will discover that he's not two years and nine months younger than his twin brother. If that doesn't bother you, you weren't listening. Okay? <laughs> Let me dramatize it a little further. Let me imagine it, that it were possible to send him at 99.99% of the speed of light it would take him nine years to make the round trip, but during that time, the Earth will have aged 636 years. That should bother you. Now, don't quarrel with the arithmetic. The point is, is that time is a physical property, and that has some profound implications for you and I. Albert Einstein summed it up very nicely. He said, people like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between the past, the present, and the future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Now, we happen to have in our possession an extraterrestrial message that's been authenticated. And uh, there are two critical discoveries that changed my life. My background is engineering, and uh, I've uh, uh, spent most a 30-year career as a techno high technology executive. The thing that impressed me most during my life is the discovery that the Bible First of all, is an integrated message, even though it's written by, in 66 separate books by 40 different guys who didn't even know each other over a period of almost 2,000 years. It's an integrated message. I'm going to demonstrate that to you in a few moments. So the first point is that there's two discoveries, that it's an integrated message. The second thing we discover is that it has its origin from outside the dimensionality of time itself. And this is going to be very, very relevant because it describes the kinds of experiences that we see coming upon the planet Earth in some very unique ways. And so that's our goal today, to explore that a little bit. Now, God, let me ask a question, is God subject to gravity? I don't think so. So God is not somebody who has lots of time. God is somebody who's outside the dimensionality of time altogether. And that's what Isaiah means when he says, it, thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Now, how does he, if he has the technology to create us in the first place, does he have the technology to get a message to us? Of course. The problem is, how does he authenticate his message? How does he let us know that the message we possess is really from him and not some kind of contrivance or some kind of fraud. How many of you here in the audience believe that this is the word of God? Wonderful, that's the politically correct response <laughs> in this community. Outside, maybe not so, but here, okay. The question you need to ask yourself desperately is how do you know? 
Because if we're correct, before this day is over, you're going to discover that we're going to be, we are being plunged into the greatest cosmic deception that will ever come upon the planet Earth. The lie. The New Testament talks about it. I don't think that's an ism. Mark Eastman and I both believe it's a very tangible, specific thing that we're going to try to cover. And you, as a member of the Christian community, are going to be, in the coming months, coming years, challenged in a way that will require you to really know why you believe this is the Word of God. But let's move on a little bit here. God authenticates it by declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Only God has that capability, not angels, not any other created thing, only God himself. And he demonstrates that this is from him, how? By writing history before it happens. Now, let me talk a little, we've talked a little bit about time. We've talked about multiple spaces, three-dimensional spaces, four-dimensional spaces, we've talked about that. Let's talk about time. You and I think of linear time. We have a tough time even thinking about two-dimensional, three-dimensional time. But let's imagine that this curve through three-dimensional space is a line that represents our timeline. Let's imagine some being is outside our dimensionality of time, and in our dimension of time, we have the past, the present, and the future, as we experience it going through this line, right? Now, an analogy here would be like the parade that's going on right now through Roswell. If you're sitting on the curb watching these floats come around the corner, for you on that curb, that parade is a linear sequence of events. But if you are outside the plane of that, of that parade, say in a helicopter above the parade, you can see the beginning at the end at the same instant. That's a clumsy analogy, but I think you get the idea. Now that means that even though for us it's past, present, and future, from someone in eternity who can watch the past, the present, and the future, it's in common, so to speak, for the one in eternity. Now, moving on, the rabbis in Israel have a quaint expression about the Torah or the Tanakh or the Bible as we would think of it. They say, we really won't understand the scripture until the Messiah comes, but when the Messiah comes, he will not only interpret the passages, he'll interpret the very words, the very letters. In fact, he'll even interpret the spaces between the letters. When I first heard that, I smiled because I just regarded it as a colorful exaggeration. Until I reread Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, where Jesus himself says, think not that I've come to destroy the Torah and the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yacht or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now a yacht or a tittle in the Hebrew is sort of equivalent. See, a yacht is sort of like our little apostrophe. A tittle is the little decorative hook on certain letters. A yacht or a tittle is sort of like us saying, a crossing of the T or the dotting of an I. They're parts of a letter. And Jesus is saying even the parts of a letter will be fulfilled. So this should give us, suddenly I realize these rabbis might be closer to the truth than I had realized. And I want to give you some examples to dramatize this before we continue. I'm going to suggest to you the great discovery in my life, and I hope it'll be in yours, is that in e each book of the Bible is a key part of an integrated message. Every name, every number, every detail, even the numerical structure behind the text is there evidences, skillful design. And as you discover that, you gain a whole different perspective and insight about what the Bible is really all about. Now let me give you a provocative example. When you're reading your book of Genesis, when you get to chapter 5, you tend to skip it. Chapters 1, 2, and 3, and 4 are exciting, meaningful, rich material. Chapter 6 on is the flood and all that business. And we're going to talk about that very meaningfully here in a little bit. But chapter 5, although it's a chapter you tend to skip, has something interesting. Bear with me, I want to show you something. In, chapter 5 is basically a genealogy of 10 guys from Adam to Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, 
Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Ten guys. It's just a genealogy. Father, son, and their ages and stuff. And you read through that, and you sort of say to yourself, what's that got to do with anything? And then you remember, gee, Chuck Missler in one of these weird conferences said that everything in there is by design. Well, let's challenge that a little bit. See, our problem here is these are transliterated, not translated, from the Hebrew. And they're proper names. A Strong's Concordance or some of your other usual helps do not deal with proper names. You have to have a root dictionary and, and have some uh, deeper types of tools to engage this. Let's take a look at what these names mean. Adam's pretty easy. Adamant means man. Seth means appointed. We know that we can glean this from Genesis 4.25. When Eve gave birth to Seth, she felt he was appointed to be a replacement for Abel whom Cain slew. It says so in verse 25 of chapter 4, previous chapter. The, word, the root Seth, first that, the word Seth comes from, uh, implies appointed. Enosh is his son, which it's a word that it comes from the root Anash, which means incurable. It's used of a wound or uh, grief, woe, sickness, or wickedness, what have you. It means, it, it actually means mortal, frail, or miserable. Tough handle to go through school with, I imagine. Now, Kenan is mistranslated in some of your Bibles because it's assumed, a uh, Bible translated assumed it was an Aramaic, would call it Canaan. No, it's Kenan. In fact, uh, Balaam makes a pun on the name in Numbers 24. Kenan means sorrow or dirge, elegy, is what the name means. Mahalalel, kind of a mouthful, but a neat name. It, uh, it comes from two parts. Mahalal, which means the blessed or praise. And the second part is El, the name for God. Mahalalel means the blessed God. Is one way to render that, uh, that uh, inference. Yared is a verb from Yared meaning shall come down. In fact, some scholars assume that in his days is when the intrusion of the strange things of Genesis 6 began. But that's a conjecture. His son is Enoch, which means commencement or teaching. Now, Methuselah is a very, very interesting name, often misunderstood by many commentators, but it comes from two roots. The word muth, it, it's a root that means death. It occurs 125 times in the Old Testament. And the verb shalak, which means to bring or send forth. Methuselah actually means his death shall bring. Now, what may surprise you is the flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. It had been preached on for four generations. Enoch, his father, apparently had a vision that as long as his newly born son was alive, the flood, the judgment flood, would be withheld. And he names him, his death shall bring. Now, if we go through and study the genealogies, you'll discover the year that Methuselah dies is the year the flood came. The prophecy was fulfilled. Interesting prophecy. Can you imagine raising that kid? Every time he caught a cold, I imagine the whole neighborhood went in a panic. <laughs> His son is named Lamech, and here the root is a root we still use today. It comes from a root in our, it was in our English word, lament or lamentation. It really means despairing. And his son is Noah. How many of you have heard of Noah? We've got about 70%, Jim. I think we've got a real problem here. Okay. No, I'm kidding. But we heard the name Noah. What does the name mean? It is derived from Nacham, which means to bring relief or comfort. Comfort or rest. And you can get this from verse 29 of chapter 5, because when Lamech names me, he indicates that. So these are, these are pretty, uh, most of them are pretty well documented. Some of them take a little digging. Now, um, yeah, see, at verse 29, it says, He called his name Noah, saying, The same shall comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands, because the ground of the Lord hath cursed. So their term comfort, nakam, is, is the root from which the word Noah comes from. So now, with this little bit of background, let's put it together. We look at Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. But now let's put together what we've learned. What does this genealogy say in English? Man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing Comfort or rest. Hallelujah. Hallelujah is right. You know, I love to do this because every time I do this a lot in different audiences, there's always a gasp. <laughs> always a gasp. Now, this is interesting for several reasons because here we have a good summary of the Christian gospel, but 
It's tucked away in a genealogy in the book of Genesis, which is part of the Torah. There's no way you will ever convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide the Christian gospel in a genealogy in their venerated Torah. No way. The fingerprints of the Holy Spirit are all over this thing. And the reason I like to use this as an example, and there's hundreds I could choose, but this is a simple one, because it demonstrates, among other things, the integrity of design. When you study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and take it seriously, you'll discover it all ties together. If you study the book of Revelation, you discover it's all in code, but every code is explained somewhere else in the scripture, and when you go through it properly, it takes you into every book in the Bible, and you realize the whole thing is a pre-planned package. Even though 40 different guys penned it over thousands of years, and uh, so on. So let's move on. Now, by the way, how does this all climax? Let's get back to this little model of our timeline. We're in that little linear time. And there's the throne in the throne room of the universe. On this timeline, there are the people of the past. I'll call them them. And there's us in the present. From the throne room of the universe, they could look down and see the dilemma, the predicament that they of the past got themselves into. And we are their offspring. So one came down to fulfill their requirements to give them a destiny that was so fantastic they could not earn it for themselves. And we are the same beneficiaries of that. This is an example where someone traveled through time, entered our time, not to alter time, but to fulfill the future, our future. And how was this done? By a love letter written in blood on a wooden cross that was erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. A pivot point that the entire universe will be measured by. The conflicts that are going to be coming upon our earth have already been precast by this event. And we'll see this all unfold here as we go forward. Now, by the way, there's some other implications of this, just to keep you off balance. If that's heaven and this is time, and A is someone that died a thousand years ago and went to heaven, no problem. B is somebody that died last week, that died and went to heaven. And C are people who are raptured, say, a week from Tuesday. <laughs> they all could arrive at heaven at the same instant. So I just mentioned that. Some of you have theological problems about GR, soul sleep and all these other heresies. There is another end run on that. And I'm not suggesting this is necessarily correct. I'm just trying to stretch your imagination relative to these dimensionalities we're talking about. Now I want to give you one other example about the scripture, because I can squeeze it into the time that I've got. Again, I, I want to build in the next hour on this text, but I want you to have a respect for this text that may go far beyond anything you've perceived so far. I want you to imagine, I'm gonna give you an assignment. Imagine, you don't literally do this, but imagine taking a piece of paper, and I want you to design a genealogy, and you're entitled, not a real one, do it from your imagination, like a piece of fiction. But I want the number of words in your genealogy to be divisible by seven exactly. You can have seven words, 14, 21, but if you divide the number of words you're using by seven, you have no remainder. You understand what I'm saying? How many could do that? I see a show of hands? Sure, okay, good number. I'd like the number of letters also to be divisible by seven exactly. That makes it a little messier, right? How many think you could still do that? Okay, I got a few hands. Let me go on. I want the number of vowels to be divisible by seven exactly, and I'd like the number of consonants to be divisible by seven exactly. How many could do that? Getting a little tougher? Okay. Yes, I'll let you use a computer, sure. The number of words that begin with a vowel should be divisible by seven exactly. The number of words that begin with a consonant should be divis divisible by seven exactly. Okay, the number of words that occur more than once should be divisible by seven. Getting a little tougher? I won't ask for a show of hands. I think some of you are losing heart on this assignment. 
The number of words that occur in more than one form divisible by seven, exactly. The number of words that occur in only one form divisible by seven, exactly. How many are still with me? Don't leave, wait, just hang on. Number of nouns that shall be divisible by seven. The number, and only seven words shall not be nouns. The number of names shall be divisible by seven. And only seven other kinds of nouns will be permitted. This, is the shoe beginning to pinch here a little bit? <laughs> The number of male names shall be divisible by seven. The number of generations shall be divisible by seven. And obviously some of you have guessed that this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter one, first 11 verses. Praise God. And obviously what I'm drawing upon here are the studies of Ivan Penin, who was born in 1855 in Russia thrown out because of plots against the Tsar and other things, and he, went, and he ultimately goes to Harvard and uh, graduates in mathematics, becomes a Christian, discovers certain things about the scripture, spent 50 years of his life obsessed with what he's discovering, so left 43,000 pages of little tiny handwritten notes of discoveries that he made. Let me give you another one that's not as well known, but is even more profound in my view. The heptatic structure of the biblical text, that is its sevens, not just in numbers of the narrative, but in the textual structure of it, is something that's been well known for years, although he, discovered, he took it a lot further. Pannon discovered that the vocabulary that's unique to the Gospel of Matthew is also divisible by seven, and in the, both the words and the letters. In other words, there's uh, 42 words that occur in Matthew and nowhere else in the New Testament, that's seven times six, and there are 126 letters in that vocabulary, which is seven times 18. Now let's just ask yourself, it gets kind of a strange characteristic, but wait a minute, how, assuming that was your goal, how could you organize that to happen? There's only two ways you could do that. One is you have to sit down with all the other writers of the New Testament and get them to agree not to use those seven words, or those uh, uh, 42 words, follow me? Or, since that's not feasible, you could wait until they've all written their stuff and then you write yours. So the unique vocabulary implies that Matthew was written last, right? So that's no problem. Gospel of Matthew has a unique vocabulary divisible by seven exactly. So it would seem to indicate that Matthew was written last, except the Gospel of Mark has the same thing. Words that are unique to Mark and no other book in the New Testament have a vocabulary that's divisible by seven exactly. And so does the Gospel of Luke. So does the Gospel of John. And so do the writings of James, Peter, Jude, and Paul, which proves each one was written last. <laughs> Not a big thing except, except, there are fingerprints all over this thing of the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to go to Bible codes and some of these other sort of speculative areas to come back with an awe and a respect for the Bible as it sits in your lap. Now, there are many certainties that Peter, for an example, had because he was an eyewitness to Jesus' miracles and so forth. But Jesus, Peter says something else in 2 Peter 1.19. He says we, that are eyewitnesses, we also have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well to take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and that day star arise in your hearts. I'm not talking about a UFO here. We'll get to that later. Um, the more sure word of prophecy, one of the things that is irrefutable is the degree to which the Bible writes history in advance. And by the way, there's no other holy book on the planet Earth that can validly make that claim. There is no prophecy in the Quran. There is no pr prophecy in the Veda or the Bhagavad Gita, there are in the Hindu writings. The Book of Mormon, no prophecy, no valid prophecy. Nostradamus, despite the claims that are made, if you investigate it, they're ambiguous and uh, those are contrived. The occultic mediums, the channelers, the New Age spirit guides, you make your list, nobody has a perfect 2020, error-free track record of predicting the future, but one book, the one you've got in your lap. A tremendous, critical foundation to our perspectives. Now, what does this book tell us? It tells us, first of all, that we are in possession 
of a message of extraterrestrial origin. So it should not surprise us to find out that UFOs and such are in here, which is the primary subject of our gathering today. The book also portrays us as objects of an unseen warfare. Boy, we better find out what's going on and what the agenda is. Our eternal destiny depends upon our relationship with the winner of this cosmic conflict. And it's becoming, it's not new, but it's becoming increasingly visible. And I believe if our perspective is correct, it's going to come to its climax during our lifetime. Fashion your seatbelts. The question that you have to answer for yourselves before the day is over <laughs> is, what is your readiness for this encounter? And by the way, just being a sincere Christian in a vital fellowship of some kind ain't enough. I uh, made the remark in some previous uh, broadcasts that a Christian cannot be abducted. And I got a call from a top executive at Universal Studios, so to speak freely, I won't mention his name, um, but he called me, he says, Chuck, I heard your thing on the radio and you're right on target. I'm very expert in this area because I was involved in a number of major projects uh, in this area. I've sat in the sessions with John Mack and Bud Hopkins and so forth, and I have to tell you, I had to track you down and call you because you're wrong. Christians can be abducted. I was so startled by the call, I, I didn't press him for more details, although he did indicate that I should investigate the Andreessen affair. And the Andreessen affair is one of these situations where apparently a very, very active Christian gal in a very, very excellent, presumably, you know, spirit-filled fellowship uh, was abducted. But if you read the record carefully, they invited her and she agreed to go. So I'm going to amend my, my conjecture that a Christian cannot be abducted against their will. And one of the things you want to deal with today is, and I have no idea which reports are valid of all the tens of thousands of reports of UFOs and encounters. And you'll discover that, uh, well, we'll get to the abduction thing here in a little bit, but you want, just because you have a Bible in your lap and you're sincere in your Christian faith, doesn't mean you've done your homework. Paul instructs you to put on the armor of God. That's an imperative. In order to do that, you better know what it is. And he says the whole armor, not just your favorite parts. So we need to deal with that. Here's our challenge. It's my conjecture that you and I, it's my belief that you and I, are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. Now, if you accept that statement, you flunk the course, because what I want you to do is challenge it. But I believe you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time, including the time that Jesus ministered here on the planet Earth. And the question is, why do I believe that? There are major prophetic themes about the end times. If you want to know what time it is on God's clock, you always look at the nation Israel. Predicted to be regathered, they are, and I won't start on that one. We'd be here all day on just that subject. City of Jerusalem, much the same about the city of Jerusalem. The more you know about the passage, the more you know what's going on in the diplomatic circles, the more you see it, Zechariah 12 starting to happen. The temple, we know the temple's going to be rebuilt because Jesus, Paul, and John all make reference to it as standing at the second coming. Why do we know it's going to be built? Because they all say so. What's exciting is they're getting ready to do that. Several hundred young guys in training and so forth. You know the story. City of Babylon has to rise to power in order to receive the judgment that has never happened, that both Jeremiah and Isaiah detail. Saddam Hussein has begun, spent over a billion dollars in 25 years rebuilding the city of Babylon. It is a long way to go, but it has started before our very noses. Russia, Magog, the more you know about Ezekiel 38 and 39 in terms of the technicalities of that passage, and the more you're up to date on the current intelligence picture in the Middle East, the more it would seem I'm not saying it will, but the more it seems that it could happen at any day now. And by the way, any of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I encourage you to take advantage of our free offer. Anyone at this conference that doesn't know, uh, get our intelligence newsletter can, by simply giving their, us their name and address, there'll be sign-up sheets in the back. If you're watching by uh, internet or whatever, you can do it on the internet. 
If you're listening by phone or on a tape, you can call us at 1-800-K-HOUSE-1, leave your name and address, ask for the year subscription to our intelligence newsletter, and we'll give you a, not a sample issue, a full year of a 32-page monthly publication that attempts to highlight the biblical relevance of current events and uh, in the hopes that you will find it addictive, of course. I hope you renew when the year's up. <laughs> the rise of China, much talked about in the scripture and certainly a major event of the coming decade. The decline of the U.S., implied by many things, and of course another subject that there's much we could talk about. While all this is going on, the rise of the European superstate, and we're going to talk a little bit about this more today. While all this is going on, religion is being championed throughout the world to become ecumenical. We'll talk a little bit about that. And obviously we're there's a move to a global government for lots of reasons. Perhaps the primary forcing function is nuclear proliferation. That's understandable. But there's another forcing function that might be the UFOs. I'll come back to that before we're through. The rise of the occult in our society. Most of us that grew up in the 50s or 60s or whatever, the big issue on the college campuses is it was rationalism versus theism. Not today. Both sides of the debates accept the supernatural, the question who's going to win. Different kind of debate on the campuses today. And of course, the other prophetic thing, it may surprise you to discover that UFOs are one of the major prophetic themes in the scripture. Now, Jesus gave us a very, very strange warning. Jesus said in Matthew 24, that famous exposition of his confidential briefing to his disciples, he said, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And I suspect there's not one Christian in a hundred that knows what that means, because they have been mistaught about the days of Noah. Most of us, unless we've done some unusual homework, have no idea what the days of Noah were really like. The question isn't the flood of Noah. There's plenty of scientific evidence that indicates that happened. The question is why? Why did God send a flood and decide to, to wipe out all life upon the earth except for nine people? You mean eight people? No, I mean nine people. Enoch was pulled out beforehand, right? His dad. But Noah and his three sons and their four wives are preserved through this ark business, right? The flood isn't the mystery. Why would God resort to that extreme measure? And I have studied this through my 40 years of biblical study as a curiosity and just an interest in the text. It's only recently it hit me between the eyes that unless you understand that, you will not understand the rest of the Old Testament. You will not really understand the prophecies of both the Old and the New. So the question that you and I are going to explore in the coming hour is what does that mean? What were the days of Noah and how does it relate to UFOs and aliens and all that stuff? 